And if it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. I go to prepare a place, and where I go, may you be there too. I'm coming again. I'm coming soon. I will call those who labor from their work to their rest. I'm coming. I'm coming soon. I will come so you can celebrate in the joy of your salvation. I've come. Won't you pray for us 
the family, and yourself. from 
Ephesians 5, walk in love. Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling But fornicators in all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as fitting for saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor coarse gestures, which are not fitting, but rather give giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an adulterer, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifested by the light. For whatever makes manifestation is light. Therefore, he says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. <clears throat> See then that you walk circumspectively, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. May God's name be praised. Selected as a hymn of comfort was written by a woman who lived in darkness, but she celebrated and praised God in the light of day. Her name was Fanny Crosby. She was blind, but she wrote over 600 hymns and poems. And one selected for today, for our comfort is blessed assurance. We ask you that you join in the singing of blessed assurance. If there is a hymnal near you, be sure to grab it. And it is hymn number 450. The most important part of that hymn is the part that resonates and should resonate with all of us. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. That was Ed's story. He was faithful. What's your story?
to my right, but I need them here, along with the table and the vest. <coughs> program together, Pat thought it not robbery to share with others to help in the telling of Ed Dobbins' story. There are several segments of friends, family, and the community listed, and each of your names that will represent those segments are also listed. We ask that you be mindful of time. Representing the areas are the church, his work, the masons, friends, the clique, and family. So that we are mindful of time, because if you understood Ed Dobbins, he didn't like anything long. I used to love it when he would do the morning announcements at Bethel. Some of you might not have been able to hear him, but I could hear every word Ed said under his breath. And when he would say, are there others of you with announcements? And people would come to his right, Ed would look at them and say, Take your time, but hurry. <laughs> so I'm going to say today, as Ed would say, take your time, but hurry. And as a commemorator of time, when you come to speak, you will be issued a robe. And if you are taking too long, the robes will be taken from you <laughs> and placed in the vase. But if you are a keeper of time and are capable of at the end of your expression, placing the robes in the vase on your own, it would be greatly appreciated. And as Ed would say, thank you. <laughs> We will begin with the, one of the pro tems of our trustee board, Mr. Paul Marshall, <coughs> Bethel <coughs> Church. On that theme of keeping it short, to the family of Brother Pierre Dobbins, my thoughts and prayers are with you as you celebrate the life of Brother Ed. Ed was a man of many skills and talent. On many occasions, we would go fishing, and Ed knew all of the fishing spots in the world, from the coast to John Day. On one occasion, we went to Oregon City, and we were fishing in this one spot, and all at once, done uh, for this Green, green out. The first thing I did was search my body for being shot. But I looked at Ed, he was calm as well. I said, What's up? He said, There's a gun range next to it. You okay? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Dobbins will be remembered as a very dependable and professional worker in the community and at Bethel. He held various positions at Bethel, such as the trustee, pro temp, Ian's part. He was the CEO of the Finance Committee and members of Son of Valley. Good friend of mine. He will also be remembered as cousin, as he was often called by our pastor. He was, in fact, he was the only person that earned that title. So for Sister Dobbins and Brother, Brother Ed was a friend a good, stable servant. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Ed and I first met in the late 60s. We both ended up at the same job. There, we worked over 30 years together. Also, we were a little bit on the activities. I was also on the Earth Board. I mean, on, yeah, on the Earth Board with Ed. Uh, sang a little bit in the uh, men's choir, but it was one of the Ladies told me I couldn't sing, so I should sit down. <laughs> and uh, for those trustee board, we did a lot of things here at the church to try to make our church function better. Uh, and also, uh, you know, one of those people that worked, he, he was good with numbers, administrative, stuff like that. He had church the same thing. He was good, he helped out the church secretary and the function of the church. I had a part too, because I was more than Martha Bucket type uh, function, you know, that they would call me and say, we need this, we need that. But it takes all of them to make the whole work. Uh, going back, uh, we, we played a lot of bid with back in the early days of the past. Ed and my wife. Uh, I don't know for sure, but it was said that they was known as whistleologists. <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 they were good. But they said there was a reason for them being so good. Uh, they had little signs they could. <laughs> now, I don't know for sure, but it was there. So anyway, uh, it, it was a long relationship of knowing him and, 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 you know, working with him. Uh, we both retired, uh, you know, and we both, uh, you know, did a lot of things together. I tried to get him to play golf with me, but he said, that's too much like work. <laughs> so he didn't play golf out there. Anyway, it was such a pleasure to know him here to work with him. So thank you.
continue. And now I still am not going to, it's my duty. Uh, I'm a, a deacon of my, in my church, and I understand. And it's my obligation to do, to do it. Amen. Uh, the last thing that we always do when we hold a started right church is the last thing we leave by saying, God bless you, my brother. Good morning. I'm Edna White. This is Gwen Johnson. And our friend Vicki Grigsby is somewhere. Bless her heart. Um, I wrote a poem, and it's kind of rough because I just started it yesterday. It was just so hard to just think about someone you've known a long time that's no longer here with us. And it's just, uh, I don't really have a title, but it's about it. Um, <clears throat> And when I refer to my friends, it's Vicki, Gwen, and myself. My friends and I were sad to hear our friend Ed had passed away. We've known him over 50 years, though it seemed like yesterday. It was just by chance we met him late one weekend night. While walking home from evening fun, Ed offered us a ride. We were not much more than kids back then. Why seemed like one big flame. My friends and I still lived at home, but Ed had spread his wings. We all had jobs or went to school to make the best of life, but we still found time to party on, and Ed found time to find a wife. After that, it was Pat and Ed, or Ed and Pat. What once was one was two. This continued over 50 years till Ed's time on earth was through. They say old friends are the best friends, and I found this may be true. We've had time to do our total lives and have been what, and have seen what we've been through. Though our lives had many changes and we've gone our separate ways, when we finally come together, we share thoughts of younger days. Days when it seemed that things were simpler, our health better, and life more fun, our joys and disappointments, and things we could or should have done. Then each of us thanked the Lord above for where we might have been if we had not changed our paths and started trusting Him. Ed Dobbins was a man of faith. And he spread his wings once more. He was invited to a party, and God opened up the door. Thank you. If I have 20 seconds or so, I'd just like to add that uh, Ed was a special friend of ours, and Thank you, Pat, for acknowledging that and being a part of our lives. And when Ed went off, he said he was going back home to visit. He came back with Pat, his, his bride. She, she, he willingly shared her with us, and we just had her going everywhere for a few months, showing her this place and that place. And But we appreciate you, Pat, and Thank you for honoring us as being friends, friends and recognizing that you and Pat and Vicki and Ed and I will be friends forever. Yeah. And we love you. Good morning, church. Good morning. I'm Stan Gaines. 
I am part of the clique. I met Ed roughly 40 plus years ago with Pat at this church. We were in the choir, we ushered, and we started hanging out together. He was the life of the party. We are scorpions, and our birthdays are like three days apart, and that bonded us together. He uh, was highly intelligent, funny, charismatic, and like I said, the life of the party. We hung out for our birthdays. We, he came up with going to Reno on a bus, get a group, we have gone to the coast, hung out for weekends, just enjoyed ourselves. There was a club called Geneva's. We opened and closed four or five days a week. I mean, we just had fun. But John was called Good Truck. During the summers, for us who had kids, Ed would take them for a week and call it camp. And they hung out with him and did, I don't know, whatever. It was fun. Uh, what else? We, I must say, bonded to birthday, basically. We hung out. A member of the church gave us the name, The Click, and we ran with it. It kind of stuck, it was fitting. It wasn't bad, like you could think of, but like I say, it fit, and we started out with 10, and over the years, we've lost a few, but Pat, we're here for you. We love you. Thank you.
believed in education, fostered it. I'm glad to understand that no biological children of his own, he took time with those of others. I'm glad to hear he was a fisherman. For Jesus says, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. He did fish for men. He was a faithful and devout mason in a grand lodge where he was even a past grand master. In our family, we call that he was a potentate. And as a kid, we call that when we watched the Flintstone stand, he was the grand puma. Ed was a man of outstanding character. And as he built his life, God built a bouquet of roses. Yellow roses today, why? Because the yellow rose should remind us of friendship and fellowship. It was a friend that knew the true meaning of fellowship. And I have just one rose left. As I said a couple of days ago, I don't want anyone to think that I'm a spokesperson for Ann Houser Bush. In fact, I don't even like their <laughs> I like Dos Equis. <laughs> and I grew up in a region of Northern California where I loved the valleys and the hills of the Napa wine country. So I don't work for it. And how the bush. But if you want to know about Gloria Ferrer, don't tell me all, they call me. <laughs> but today I want to say to that, with all of the years that you've had the friend, and it's just been you and Ed, know that there are other people who saw you as a model for how a couple should be. They probably even rejoiced and celebrated that although you didn't have any children, you had the time and the attention to devote to them. So I just want to pause and say this bud for you. joys in being at Bethel Portland and appreciating the assignments and the knowledge that God has called me and what I can do in community all begins with the first week or two of my husband Arthur and I moving here. Met Ed Dobbs. Most of you have already heard that Ed was the finance man. Ed came to me and very seriously said, I know you want to know, Pastor, how much money we have, and I'm going to answer that right quickly. None. <laughs> and he said, I know you'll probably want to know what your salary would be, and he said, it could be a million dollars a year if you can raise it. <laughs> so I said, 
did at that point. I said, oh, well, we're going to be great friends. And he said, yeah, I got a feeling, young woman, you're going to work it out. And I said, not me by myself, but God and the people. It's been fun. Hey, I won't call it fate, but I will say it's God's plan that this celebration would be on a Wednesday. Because Wednesday was the day that of the week that Ed would leave Happy Valley and drive down to the church and he would tell Sister Florida, I'll be there when I get there. <laughs> and whenever he came, he was welcome and on time to help balance the accounts, make a deposit if need be, and to sign checks. Ed had it together. It was never missed a church administrative meeting to give the financial report. Because he said, I'm going to be there to support you. He said, Pat might be running late, but we'll get there when we get there. Just don't, just hold them off till we get there. He said, because they're only interested in three, four numbers anyway. How much money did we have last month? How much money did we get this month? How much of it did we spend? And how much of it do we have left? And so he said, I keep telling them, Pastor, when your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep becomes your downfall. And if you want to have money, either give some or don't spend so much. But he told the truth, he was real. And the one principle Ed believed in was tithing. You never saw or heard Mr. Dobbins trying to sell you a ticket to anything. He just gave, whether that was his time or his finances. In representing this church as the other at large member to the Commission on Stewardship and Finance is Sister Florida Blake. Florida might have thought she was Ed's boss, but Ed was everybody's boss. <laughs> Sister Blake with a resolution. Good morning. Reverend Terry sums up Brother Ed Dobbins. He meant to be with that. A resolution in loving memory of Mr. Edward Douglas Dobbins. Whereas Mr. Edward Douglas Dobbins was a faithful and dedicated member of Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church since 1971 and attended worship services on a regular basis. He gave cheerfully of his personal finances, time, and talent in support of the church. Ed was very active on the trustee board, served as the chief usher on the usher ministry number two, held the office of second and third vice president in the lay organization, and sang in various choirs. And whereas Ed Dobbins worked steadily on the church stewardship and finance commission and used his skills as the church office bookkeeper, he served under different pastors as the second vice chairman of the stewardship and finance commission. He developed a finance procedure that incorporated checks and balances in the process of handling, handling the church finance. Ed installed and updated the finance software computers and any other equipment that was needed in the administration of the office. And whereas Ed Dallas loved the Lord and showed it by working in his vineyard on the commission, by attending meetings and helping to make decisions, and many he spoke just a few words in a profound voice, but when he did speak, it was like E.F. Hutton. Everybody listened. <laughs> when it was time for the commission to make an announcement during church services, Ed was always appointed to speak. He captured everyone's attention immediately and promptly delivered his message that could be easily understood. And whereas Ed was a solid worker on the commission, taking field trips to the bank for deposits and transactions, with his 
good friend on the commission, Thomas Darby. He carried out his duties on days he did not feel well. Some days he drove himself, other days Pat would drive him, but he was determined to follow through with his assigned duty. And whereas the Lord our God, in his infinite wisdom, he called his servant from labor to reward on Saturday, September 19, 2020, and therefore be it resolved that the church will miss his presence. But in my father's house, there are many mansions for his servants like Mr. Ed Dodd. We rejoice in the life well spent join in heartfelt sympathy and offer sincere prayers to the bereaved family and be it further resolved that all should be encouraged and find comfort, hope, and peace from the loving remembrance of Edward Douglas Dodge, who many memories that will forever be with us. And be it finally resolved, a copy of this resolution will be filed in the archives of Delco Abbey Church and a copy will be given to the family. Submitted in humble adoration. Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church family, this 14th day of October 2020. The Reverend Jerry McCray Hill, pastor. There was a resolution from afar, from the desk of Reverend Leslie Raphael White, to the beloved family at Edward Dobbins, Sister Pat Dobbins. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints, Psalm 116, 15. It is not the time we gather, it's the time we met that is so transformational. Dear beloved Pat and precious Dallas family, we met because you and your husband worked with the youth under the pastoral leadership of A. Lee Henderson and Bethel Church in the late 60s and early 70s. Pizza and games in your homes on Friday and Saturday evening, driving movies on other occasions. I remember coming in late at a A.B at Bernard's home. My excuse was, I was at the drive-in with Ed and Pat and the other youth. Ainsley looked at me and said, well, you better get your poo in the morning because Ed Dobbins expects you to be at church. You care, a home was exploding due to parental divorce. Ed and you were stabilizing spaces. Hands, presence of God, and Christ empowered by the Holy Ghost. I didn't know then, but now I do. You were God's answer to Pernice's prayer. You were keeping me and other youth out of the hands of holies. You were that edge around us that drugs and other negatives could not penetrate. For you held us accountable for our lives no matter what we faced. You are there and we are graduating from high school because of you and Ed, I am. Love moves from both your eyes, sparkling with the joy that welcomes us. The late poet, and writer Brian Angelo once said, Do your eyes dance when you see the children and they see you? I must say a resounding yes. For each time we were together, my soul danced, following the lead from your and Ed's eyes. Now that the years have passed, I'm keenly aware that life's journey stops at both sweetness and bitterness. So when I say thanks, because I know I've never really said it to you or Ed, for your faithfulness, love, mercy, it's not because of your perfection, because you endured life and smile, smile, and smile. Frankly, through my tears, I just see both of your smiles, even now. Thanks, Pat, thanks, Ed, for giving me a portion of your faithfulness, your love, your life, and your soul. I am certainly Glory, Mama, and plenty of others who have gone on before Ed, have now greeted Ed with great hugs of victory, kisses, of love and smiles, smiles of joyful thanks. To God be the glory, to God be the glory, to God be the glory, who through Ed and Pat Dallas has done and is doing great things for us. Renee and I pray, Pat and entire family, your healing, your strength, your recovery of joy. In our God and our Lord Jesus Christ, empowered by our Holy Ghost, remember, precious is the sight of the Lord, Death of his saints, grace and power, Leslie our wife, recipient of the faith, hope, and love of Ed and Pat Dobbins. From St. John's African Methodist Episcopal Church, Reverend Robert Maurice Wright II, servant pastor, to the family of Brother Edward Dobbins, it is with a profound sense of loss that we extend this letter of condolence to you in the passage of Brother Edward Dobbins. 
On behalf of the entire St. John Amy Church family, Reverend Loretta Wright and me, please accept our deepest sympathy and our hearts are deeply sad. We would like the family to know that during this difficult moment, our thoughts and prayers are always with you. I was truly blessed by his personal interest in my ministry when he visited our churches I pastor. He was a blessing not only to me, but to many more whose lives he touched. I am so thankful for the influence he had in my life. We pray that the love of God that holds you through this journey to grief, knowing that those we love will remain with us, who love itself lives on in our cherished memory, for never fade. Just imagine, there were no stars in the sky, but just openings where our loved ones will shine and let us know they are happy. May you take comfort in knowing this is not the end in this service. Reverend Maurice Wright II, International President, Music and Christian Arts of the AME Church. I know those were long res uh, resolutions, and it would not stay. <laughs> Thank you. Song and Grand Inspector General L. D. Dobbins, First Circuit Creek. Whereas him who is, was, and always shall be, has determined that his messenger's death would take from our ranks and from his life, Song and Grand Inspector General L. D. Dobbins, one of the one of our most beloved prayers, and whereas the Song and Grand Inspector General Edward D. Dobbins was born on 1 November 1946 in Decatur, Alabama and was called from his earthly labor to eternal rest on 19 September 2020 at the age of 73. And whereas, although we grieve, we know that the grand architect is he that doeth all things well, even though to us sometimes it passes our understanding, and that the outstanding character of the deceased, his manifold acts and benevolence and charity, will serve as a monument to posterity as well as our constant reminder to the brothers, the, the prayers of mortal man, and whereas we are grateful, sure that because of his honorable record, while well, here in flesh and blood, he will merit and be accorded a final resting place in that celestial consistory where the grand architect rules as supreme architect, and that our beloved, solemn grand inspector general Dobbins can say his work here on earth, our fall in good fight. Therefore, be it resolved that we, the members of Washington and Oregon Council of Deliberation, extend our heartfelt sympathy and that of the United Supreme Council of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite of Free Nations, Northern Jurisdiction, Prince Hall Affiliation, to the family, relatives, and friends to this their honor of bereavement when the Grand Architect comes to talk, take his toll. We pray the rich blessings of the Grand Architect upon those left to sustain this imperative loss. Be it further resolved that as the body of our brother returns to Mother Earth from whence it came, that the radiance of the star in the east guide his soul to the heavenly consistory in that holy city, not made by hands eternal in heaven, and that as the brethren of the celestial consistory invite some grand inspector general Thomas to enter and have a seat in the eternal east. As they welcome him, we say as our final to lose. He Peace be with you, our brother. Be it result, further resolved that the final rites are being conducted in, on this 14th day of October 2020, and that a copy of this resolution be given to the family and a copy placed in the archives of this decision, given under my hand and sealed in Washington and Oregon, Council of Deliberation, this 14th day of October 2020, attested by Damien E. Giles, Sr., Illustrious Secretary. Gregory D. Rag, Senior, Gregory Gregory, Green Post, and Lester to the Land and Chief. Is mine to live for Jesus. 
Ed would tell me, come on in my office and get your check. And I said, where is your office? And he said, well, actually, it's Florida's, but it's mine today. So I would go in there, and I don't know if you were listening when Sister Bobby read the obituary, and she read that one of his siblings was the Reverend William Curtis Dobbins. It was family to a pastor, and he knew how to talk to me in a pastorly brother way. Ed would tell me sometimes when I'd be anxious, he said, you know, don't be afraid to let these people know you human too. You're not God, you just work for the man. Right. Right. He said, you hurt when you're kicked or punched. You bleed when you're cut. He said, don't be superwoman. Be vulnerable. And then he said, I want to tell you something else. It was the one Sunday I preached a sermon that approached the 45 minute mark. Ed happened to be ushering. It was second Sunday. And I said, oh, I'm going to get that uh, usher board number two. I'm going to get back at them today. And I'm going to preach long, because they usually lay, but they going to hear everything today. Ed was on the door. I had to go in his office and get my check. <laughs> and when I went in the office, Ed said to me, listen, I want to tell you something. He said, it's going to sound a little sexist, but that's okay. I'm your cuz, you'll forgive me. He said, a sermon ought to be like a mini skirt. He said, long enough to cover the subject and short enough to make it interesting. <laughs> And I said, okay, I hear you. <laughs> now, uh, to be honest, pastoring doesn't just mean you need to always be at the church or always at the parsonage. Pastoring means you're out in the community, you're meeting people, you're going places. I had the distinct pleasure of one morning rising, and I said, oh, I don't feel well, but I have to go down here to this luncheon at Embassy Suites. My husband said, well, why don't you just put your clothes on, I'll drive you down there, and you'll probably get there, see some people, and feel better. You know, the spouse, always knows you have somewhere to go, but they don't know exactly what it is till they get you there. That morning we were going because the United Methodist Church was having their general conference here in the city of Portland. It was at the uh, Moda Center, but the African American Seminary of the United Methodist Church is Gammon School of Theology out of Atlanta. And they had invited me to their luncheon, and it was at Embassy Suites. So we went. And they said, oh, we have a spot for you. And they said, don't let anyone sit to the two seats to the right of you and Mr. Arthur, my husband. So I said, sure. He said, they're not here yet. 
And as I was seated at this table, I said, Arthur, I'm not sure I'm supposed to be here. Do you know who these people are? I said, they're the old guard. They're professors who have written books in church administration and theology. They are the think tanks of the United Methodist Church when it comes to black church. And then I looked up and I heard the voice, hi pastor. <laughs> and then all of these professors and doctors of religion stood up and said, hey, yeah, how you doing? <laughs> and it was a marvelous time. So when I speak to you today, I speak in truth. Because you never know who you have that walk among you. Those men you had, because some of them were from Alabama, others of them you had because of his brother, Reverend Dr. William Curtis Dobbins. But they respected the man who Ed was and the family from whence he had come and the representation of the region of the United States, Decatur, Alabama, that he upheld. So today, for a brief time, I want to talk to you from the subject, Take Time to Live. It's found in Ephesians 5, Simply because the book of Ephesians was a letter written to a church in Ephesus that was kind of mixed up. You know, they had some problems going on. They said they knew God, loved Christ, and would follow after his holy ways. But somehow, they also were trying to live a life of the world. They had one foot over here and another foot over here. As they say down south, they straddled the fence. But the letter in verse 5 says, follow God's example. Therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The letter goes on to say, and I'm skipping a few lines, for once you were in darkness, but now you are the light of the Lord. Live as children of the light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Three things that Ed believed in. Goodness. I never heard him have a crossword with anyone. If he did, he didn't tell me about it. And you show me and talk about it. Because I didn't hear it later. He was righteous. Ed took time to get things right. He wanted you to hurry up with it, but he wanted it to be correct. You heard people say he wanted a balanced budget, balanced books, a true balance. And truth. Ed told you the truth, whether it hurt or not. It's the truth. And he would always say, deal with it. <laughs> and find out what pleases God. It sums up in that paragraph of the letter, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible. And everything that is illuminated becomes a light. You know what that means? What goes on in the dark is going to come to the light. 
But the joy of it is summed up by saying, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And then this is the part that for the next five minutes we're going to talk about. Be very careful then how you live. Take time to live. You know, sometimes in putting how well you know the other person. That's called relationship. It's called pastoral care. Pastoral care isn't just when a person is sick and you show up at their house. Pastoral care takes place when you see them every Sunday. And you can relate. And they don't go through no crazy ups and downs and turnarounds with you. And they can dispense some good solid wisdom and advice. Ed would tell me, come on in my office and get your check. And I said, where is your office? And he said, well, actually, it's Florida's, but it's mine today. So I would go in there, and I don't know if you were listening when Sister Bobby read the obituary, and she read that one of his siblings was the Reverend William Curtis Dobbins. It was family to a pastor. And he knew how to talk to me in a pastorly brother way. It would tell me sometimes when I'd be anxious he said, you know, don't be afraid to let these people know you fool me too. You're not God. You just work for the man. All right. All right. He said, you hurt when you're kicked or punched. You bleed when you're cut. He said, don't be superwoman. Be vulnerable. And then he said, I'm going to tell you something else. It was the one Sunday I preached a sermon that approached the 45 minute mark. Ed happened to be ushering. It was second Sunday. And I said, oh, I'm going to get that uh, usher board number two. I'm going to get back at them today, and I'm going to preach long, because they usually lay, but they don't hear everything today. Ed was on the door. I had to go in his office and get my check. And when I went in the office, Ed said to me, listen, I want to tell you something. He said, it's going to sound a little sexist. But that's okay. I'm your cuz. You'll forgive me. He said, a sermon ought to be like a miniskirt. He said, long enough to cover the subject and short enough to make it interesting. <laughs> and I said, okay, I hear you. Now, to be honest, pastoring doesn't just mean you need to always be at the church or always at the parsonage. Pastoring means you're out in the community, you're meeting people, you're going places. I have the distinct pleasure of one morning rising and I said, oh, I don't feel well, but I have to go down here to this luncheon at Embassy Suites. 
My husband said, well, why don't you just put your clothes on, I'll drive you down there, and you'll probably get there, see some people, and feel better. You know, the spouse always knows you have somewhere to go, but they don't know exactly what it is till they get you there. That morning, we were going because the United Methodist Church was having their general conference here in the city of Portland. It was at the uh, Moda Center, but the African American Seminary of the United Methodist Church is Gammon School of Theology out of Atlanta. And they had invited me to their luncheon, and it was at Embassy Suites. So, we went, and they said, oh, we have a spot for you. And they said, don't let anyone sit to the two seats to the right of you and Mr. Arthur, my husband. So I said, sure. He said, they're not here yet. And as I was seated at this table, I said, Arthur, I'm not sure I'm supposed to be here. Do you know who these people are? I said, they're the old guard. They're professors who have written books in church administration and theology. They are the think tanks of the United Methodist Church when it comes to black church. And then I looked up and I heard the voice, hi, pastor. And then all of these professors and doctors of religion stood up and said, Hey, man, I can do it! <laughs> and it was a marvelous time. So when I speak to you today, I speak in truth. Because you never know who you have that walk among you. Those men knew Ed because some of them were from Alabama. Others of them knew Ed because of his brother, Reverend Dr. William Curtis Dobbins. But they respected the man who Ed was and the family from whence he had come and the representation of the region of the United States Decatur, Alabama, that he upheld. So today, for a brief time, I want to talk to you from the subject, Take Time to Live. Children of the light. 
For the fruit of the life consists in all goodness, righteousness, yeah. and truth. Yeah. Three things that Ed believed in. Goodness. I never heard him have a crossword with anyone. If he did, he didn't tell me about it, and you showed him talk about it, because I didn't hear it later. He was righteous. Ed took time to get things right. He wanted you to hurry up with it, but he wanted it to be correct. You heard people say he wanted a balanced budget, balanced books, a true balance. And truth, Ed told you the truth, whether it hurt or not. It's the truth. And he would always say, deal with it. <laughs> and find out what pleases God. It sums up in that paragraph of the letter, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible. And everything that is illuminated yes. becomes a light. Yes. You know what that means? What goes on in the dark is going to come to the light. Yes. But the joy of it is summed up by saying, wake up, sleeper. Yes. Rise from the dead. Right. And Christ will shine on you. And then this is the part that for the next five minutes we're going to talk about. Be very careful, men, how you live. Take time to live. You know, sometimes in putting the liturgy together, which is, you know, the bulletin format for Sunday morning worship, that takes a lot of time to coordinate. You know, I'm not just opening the hymnal, selecting hymns that I think we haven't sung in a while, but it all should fit nicely with the scripture right. and build up right. to the right. service. I could tell when I would hit a, a pew of someone uh, with the morning hymn that was selected, and sometimes I would know his head. And it would be when we would sing that hymn, I think it's number 215, don't get nervous, we're not singing it today. <laughs> but it is, I have a message from the Lord, hallelujah, and it's only that you look and live. A message full of love, hallelujah, it is only that you look and live. I look out there and end. Egypt, they had to leave 
even time came for the bread to rot. But today it is celebrated Hallelujah. at a great big banquet table. You know, ceremonially in the Old Testament, when they drank wine, they drank it in goblets. Some of you, just like me, have goblets at home. Our goblets are probably glass now, right? So we can throw them in the fireplace when we get done. Please, don't throw your water tree into the fireplace. But then they were made of brass and crystal. And they, as opposed to crystal, and they were made of brass and they were heavy. So that you could
might be presented radiant without spot or wrinkle. Time is winding up. Won't you take time to live one day? Each one of us will have a reservation at a local cemetery without the privilege of cancellation. And what would you say you have done with your allotted time? You know, taking my seat five minutes and you stretch to 15. I'm glad you noticed the time. My grandmother and them would sing a song that said, Elsie, in all my appointed time, I'm going to wait until my change comes. This is its appointed time, and its change has come. And I'm glad to have had the opportunity to know the man, still be able to love his spirit, and know that his change has come. Some may be wondering, Ed is still in Happy Valley, but it has a different location. It's not Happy Valley, Clackamas, Oregon, but it's Happy Valley Heaven. Some might ask where it's located, and I'll say just like Ed began most of his saying, well, like we say down south, it's up yonder. So if anybody should ask you where Ed has gone, he's in Happy Valley. God bless and keep you. And one day, we will be able to say, hello, Ed, and we'll keep it brief. The benediction will be at Ed's resting spot at home. Alabama, where the dirt is red and rich, and it's God's country. From dust to 